Sam. Hey. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you doing? Not good. Do you ever know where are, there are any outlets? Uh, I maybe at the back. Just, no, I just checked. Okay. So there are like none up here other than the ones that are located directly on the stage. I doubt it. I mean, I just you could probably reach use that one if you want to. You try. Really need You're not to. recording right now, are you? Yeah, it's okay though. It doesn't should... matter. So <laughs> it's no problem. I'll just edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> sections, but we dropped them at a time when there were already other sections. Is that right? Am I summarizing this correct, Sam? Yeah. Approximately. You'll get an email about that. We still expect to be able to accommodate all of you in the way that you most want, uh, but you know, there's a little bit of a bump here that uh, we'll get through. Um, and I wanted to say that, of course, I have remarks prepared today as usual to discuss with you, but I'm always open to questions, and you should have noticed a pattern by now, which is that at the beginning of every class, I say, are there any questions? I'd like to hear them. And then at the end, I usually allow five or 10 minutes for questions as well. And any time in between, you can raise your hands. So any questions about what we've been talking about so far? You know, it's a public service when you ask questions. Some of you may think maybe the question that I ask, you know, would be stupid, or maybe people will think I'm a gunner, or, you know, you know, what does it mean if the professor already knows me? Maybe I shouldn't ask the question because, uh, but actually, probably if you're confused about something, uh, other people uh, would be confused about it too. And besides which, I can redirect your question, or I can not take questions if I don't want to. So you can just dis displace that any feelings of responsibility to me. If you have anything you'd like to ask. Yes. What's your name? Alexander. Alexandria. Concerning what you discussed at the end of last lecture about why a, like, evolution hasn't created a perfect organism, yes. it's because extrinsic cause uh, factors is what's interesting. Could, like, That's a theory as to why they're not involved. Right. There aren't any more organisms, yes. Could that be taken to like a logical extension that if we were to create an environment that was completely controlled for extrinsic, if extrinsic 
factors that we could actually allow for natural selection of a organism without intrinsic. Yeah, I mean that it would of course take a very long time to do right. such an experiment. I don't know if anyone's done experiments like that with Drosophila or uh, or uh, bacteria or yeast. It would be a really cool experiment to do. Actually, we could do it in my lab. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it could be fun, kind of fun to do. Which is, of course, you would require perfect knowledge of what a perfect environment is for the organism, free of any extrinsic causes of death, no predation, no food shortages, no temperature fluctuations. And then, what you could see is over generations is the lifespan of the organism lengthening, or some other kind of um, measure. Um, and you know, you can principle do that. But that's the thought experiment that you would have to do in maybe design a way to test it, but that's right. Other questions, right, please? Yeah, what's your name? Justin. Justin, huh? Uh, are there a little bit of the day before the day? Uh, Say that again, before the day or after the day? Yeah. You, you may have noticed that my lectures are quite key to the readings. I try to make it easier. I hated it when I was a student and the professor would get ahead of the reading materials. And I, but I also try not to simply recapitulate what's in the materials because that's also just totally boring. So the pattern is typically the reading, my lectures are very closely keyed to the readings uh, for that day. And if you've done the readings, you'll get more out of the lectures. Now on the other hand, if you see the lecture first and then do the readings, the readings will seem to have gotten the big frame and the, and the big ideas. I tended to, when I was a student, tended to prefer to try to do the readings first and then go to the lectures. And every lecture I'll mention, I'll say, as you saw in your readings, but I'll talk much about much more than just what was in the readings. Because I try to give you very focused, kind of interesting to read materials for every class. And not too big. When I first started teaching this class eight years ago, the readings were almost twice as long. And you know, I got feedback from the students, and so I learned uh, what to do. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, what's your name? Uh, Angela. Angela, uh huh? That's a really good question, Angela. So we've, a bunch of kids have been asking about that. A bunch of you were after class asking me about this question. I think what I'm going to do is, I, I used to spend like 10 minutes in lecture talking about how to do the adjustment. Maybe next year I'll add all this stuff back. And what I may do is, if Sam helps me remember, is I will post some slides that illustrate exactly how you do it. But here's the basic intuition. Let's say you have a population here that's a very young population, uh, and, uh, and like, uh, like Panama. And you have a population here that's an older population like Sweden. And you want to compare their mortality, but you want to take into account the fact that they have different age structures in the population. This is a young population, that's an old population. So a head-to-head -head comparison is not fair because you know, these people here may look like they're dying more, but it's not because the diseases are worse here, it's because they're just more susceptible people, they're older people. What you do is, is you, you pick a third population which you treat as the standard, which has a fixed age structure. For the sake of argument, imagine you have 100 people over here, 10 are 10 years old, 10 are 20 years old, 10 are 30 years old, 10 are 40, and so forth. 100 people at each decile of age. And that's your standard population. Then you go to the Panama group and you say, among 10-year-olds, what fraction of 10-year-olds die in a given year? Let's say one out of 1,000. You take that one out of 1,000 number and you multiply times these 10 people and you get you know, one out of 100 deaths among 10-year-olds here. You with me now? Then you go back to Panama and you say, well, what fraction of of 50-year-olds uh, die. Well, one out of two. So you go here to the 10 50-year-olds, and say, okay, five of you are going to die. And what fraction of 100-year-olds die? All of you die here. And you go here, and then you multiply it here. And then you compute the number of deaths using the Panama rates in the perfect population. Then you repeat the exercise for Sweden. I actually find it very helpful when I learn things to have a kind of kinesthetic. Those of you that are dancers will know that. Like, if you like, you move your body when you're learning something, at least for me, it helps me remember. So like I visualize in space ideas, you know? So now imagine you go over here, and you do the same thing, and then you map the, the population-specific mortality rates by age to the idealized population. And then you compare those two numbers, you see? Now you conclude that the force of mortality in Sweden is lower than the force of mortality in Panama when applied to the identical age-structured population. Is that clear? Is that helpful? Yeah, so did you do that with like, when you do that with like income? Yeah, you do anything you want, exactly. Take into account race or, or, or income or whatever you want to control for. And of course you can get even more elaborate, some of you have taken advanced statistics, 
even more elaborate, you can control for many things at once, right? You can adjust for age and sex and income and all kinds of things. Yeah, what's your name? Gianna. Gianna, yeah. Um, Yeah, um, and they were arguing about that in the article. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, just, I was kind of confused by there's a similar game between Asian Pacific and Southern Pacific, and then they said they were using 1970s or Asian Pacific. So there, instead of creating this like fictitious society that had 10 of each decile, what's customary is just you pick actually some real age distribution, like the age distribution in the United States in 1970. And then you multiply the, can the specific mortality from the two periods of time, 1970 and 1990, or 1990 and 2010, standardized to the 1970 population. Now the reason this is important is imagine we're trying to predict whether we're making progress against cancer. And we pick as our idealized population against which to standardize a population of nursery school kids. So the same example as before, but now instead of having 10 people at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of age, we have 100 people that are 10-year-olds, okay? And now we go and we compute how deadly it is to be a 10-year-old in Panama and how deadly it is to be a 10-year-old in Sweden, and we find that actually it's the same. Everyone would be still, right? 10-year-olds have an equal probability, let's say, of dying in Sweden and Panama. We go and we multiply those numbers times the standard of the population, and we see no difference in mortality between Sweden and, and Panama. But actually, that's totally stupid, because in fact, cancer is a real big killer of elderly people in one country and not in the other, but now we've arbitrarily standardized it to a population of young people, and so we fail to be able to discern the difference between Panama and Sweden because of our crazy choice of a standardized population. And that's what Baylor, he skewers his opponent by saying, you would have us standardized against the medieval age distribution at some point in the paper. So they're contending what's the right standard. You see, that's part of what's happening. So there's a methodologic debate that's taking place between them as well. Other questions? These are good questions. I'm sure half the class was interested in age standardization. I know, because so many of you asked. Anything else? Good. I'm going to train you guys to ask questions. OK, so last time we saw the following. We saw the changes, we saw the changes that had occurred over the last 100 years in medical care and in the causes of death. And yet we saw that most of the improvements in health across many different conditions, infectious diseases, cancer, and cardiac diseases, preceded by far in time the invention of specific treatments for those relevant uh, conditions. And we also saw in a number of ways, for, we saw this in a number of ways for a number of diseases and in a number of historical periods. And these events, these reductions in mortality, whatever their source, we also saw, did not accrue evenly to all people. We saw that there were widening differentials by income, by race, by sex, uh, across time. So even though people are getting healthier, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we see widening gaps. And we concluded with a kind of sensibility that the tension between the treatment of individuals and, and, and prevention in populations still is a, a problem, still is a kind of intellectual and pragmatic tension as we think about the health of the public. Now, <clears throat> there are different ways, in fact, of measuring uh, socioeconomic status. And I'm going to use this concept rather loosely today. I'm going to speak about SES, but of course we could be more firm and more specific. Um, you can imagine, for instance, money is a measure of socioeconomic status. Education is a measure of socioeconomic status. Occupation, or you might think of some kind of status measure in itself, uh, some other kind of measure of socioeconomic status. Now, education offers the advantage in that, at least in principle, it's available to everyone, men and women alike. Uh, and also it offers, for instance, in principle, it's available to everyone. And second, that it tends to be fixed early in age. So you don't have to worry about the problem of so-called reverse causation that we'll come back to shortly. Uh, basically, everyone acquires their education at the beginning of their lives, and they have outcomes later on in their life. So you don't have to worry about those outcomes causing the education. You can be fairly confident that if you observe something, it's the education that caused uh, the outcome. And status here might refer to a number of other things. It might refer to, for instance, being a descendant of the passengers on the Mayflower, or if you're from Australia, a descendant of passengers on the First Fleet, or a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad that get to wear a black turban, or being an aristocrat, or being a user of an Apple Macintosh computer, uh, or being in Styles or Silliman. You know, these are high status kind of uh, attributes. 
and uh, and um, and so, but they are not like uh, money or education or occupation, and they can be assigned to you in, uh, in some kind of way, or just plain having charisma. All of you probably in your lives have encountered somebody who just was charismatic, right? Who had some kind of quality that you couldn't quite put your finger on. Made you want to follow this person. Made you want to admire this person. Maybe the way they spoke, or the way they held their body, or, or just something about them, the glow, uh, that this has been understood since time immemorial, that people had a charisma. It comes from the Greek word charisma, which means a gift. Literally, it used to be called a gift from God. And so those people might have that kind of a gift that's independent, let's say, of these other kind of more socially assigned uh, money, education, occupation, or so forth. Now, if you're poor or less educated, you're just more likely to die. And there's a very convincing gradient in this regard. The richer and richer you are, the more and more educated you are, the healthier you are. So, uh, so this slide shows this slide shows uh, age-adjusted death rates in 25 to 64 year olds according to education, income, race, and sex. So, for example, if you look at white men, the more schooling you get, the lower your age-adjusted mortality is. The you know the, lo the longer you live the more educated you are. And this obtains in both white men uh, and in white women. So it goes from this number to some lower number, kind of monotonically decreases. And deal for income. So the richer you are, here are measured at the low end of the scale, these are data are now very old, uh, the, the less likely you are to die. And this obtains in men and in women and in blacks and in whites. And the only exception on this chart, for reasons I don't fully understand, is this blip up among college-educated black men whose mortality actually bumps up a little bit. It doesn't monotonically decline. But in every one of these categories, there's a gradient where the more education you have step by step, or the more wealth you have step by step, the healthier you are. And in fact, even just finishing college, this gradient persists, not just, for instance, if you take someone from no education to primary education, or from primary to secondary, even if you take someone and give them a college education, this appears to still be yielding some benefits in terms of longevity uh, for uh, the individuals in the population. And this table shows something similar, but here in terms of cardiovascular disease. Uh, so this shows age-adjusted death rates from heart disease now, in again, a similar age population, according to income, race, and sex. And here, if you go up the income gradient, you see that there is improvement uh, you know, amongst white men and black men and white women and black women. And if you took the ratio of the lowest to highest income, you see that for this gradient in income of roughly 10 grand to 25 grand, poor people are 2.5 times the likelihood uh, compared to rich people uh, of, uh, of having cardiovascular disease. And it's similar amongst black men and so forth. But one of the things that's interesting about this chart is now if you also compare the columns, you compare, for instance, white men to black men, black men have a higher risk of dying, but their risk of dying is like they're 3.9 versus 3.2. If you divide the two numbers, you get a ratio of 1.21 give a 21% higher uh, risk of dying, that relative risk you might intuit is smaller than the rest of the risk based on income. So we spend a lot of time in our society obsessing and being concerned about relative inequality according to race, but I would suggest to you that actually a much bigger differentiator is income, wealth. The poor suffer terribly in our society uh, when it comes to health and in other, other ways as well. And, they, and the poor don't get as much attention in my judgment as they warrant. Now, usually, the direction of causation is taken to be from socioeconomic status to health. And this is hypothesized to occur in a number of ways. So what are some ways, let me ask you guys, that your socioeconomic status might cause your health or health status in some way? What are some ways that could happen? If you have the time to decide to go on your regular checkups. Regular checkups. So you buy more health care. Yeah, Jim. Buy better food. Good. Yeah. <coughs> so more education what? Yeah, so you're going to have money, you're going to buy more education, and buying more education is going to make those goods for you. Or, forget the money, if I give you education, that education is going to give you knowledge that can improve your health. And we saw some examples of that uh, earlier in earlier lectures. Other ideas? You know what's your name? Angela. Angela, yeah. Yeah, buy better safety uh, where you live. That's right. Other ideas. So this, uh, not always just money, right? It could be other measures, yeah? Yeah, more leisure time, which you could use then in ways that would be salubrious, health, health affirming. Yeah, what's your name? Aaron. Aaron, huh? Um, you're more likely to have as much money to follow your doctor's advice. 
all your doctor's advice. So we have a bunch of them, you guys are emphasizing how money is going to get you access to medical care. How sympathetic do you think I'm going to be to that argument? <laughs> Already you should be getting to see that actually medical care is not the main driver for these things. I'm going to pound this point home. You'll see. Yeah? Yeah, so people, the poor are stressed, right? They have a lot of stress in their lives. That could be very harmful as well. Excellent point. Yeah, what's your name? Joel. Joel, uh-huh. Um, well, the more money you have, um, the kind of job that you're working with less uh, is really glorious. So that's obviously a piece of better health. Yes, yeah, so although it's very interesting, you're right, uh, and there is a way in which occupation can be associated with health in different ways, but it's kind of weird the way that's changed. If you look at uh, blue-collar laborers like 50 years ago, they actually were uh, quite thin, actually, because of their labor. And they got a lot of exercise in their jobs. And one of the things that's been happening in our society is we've been transitioning to more sedentary service economy, which is actually not necessarily good for people's health. So you can, can have a kind of reversal on this axis. But yeah, in fact, Yeah, so that's another good way. We'll come back to that one, because I love that, of course, network ideas. What's your name? Ike. Ike. Yeah, so there are lots of ways, and you guys have produced many of them. Uh, these, types of, these types of phenomena, you know, uh, these act things, money, education, occupation, status, allow you to, you know, have access to nutrition, <coughs> sanitation, material comfort, change your risk behaviors. You know, if you're a high status person, you might be less likely to smoke. That's, you know, you're influenced by your peers. Access to abusive health care, a couple of you also put that out. But they clearly do not explain all uh, of the relationship between the two. Because, for example, as we've already begun to see, when it comes to the issue of health care, at least at the population level, it's not the case that more health care buys you more health. Okay? So having more money that gets you more health care, that doesn't necessarily mean you become healthier, as you've already begun to see over the last few lectures. Nevertheless, in terms of certain other of the features that you guys identified and that were on the previous slide, things, for example, like risk behaviors, here's the age-adjusted prevalence of current tobacco smoke, current cigarette smoking, in 2000 among 25 year old people and older according to education level. So uh, here's whether or not you're currently a smoker, here's how much education you have, and uh, the people that have college degrees have the lowest prevalence of tobacco smoke. So there's a nice gradient in terms of this risk factor. So maybe something about having more education as you suggested, uh, what was your name? Uh, Achua. Achua suggested, you know, maybe the education is resulting in lower, uh, lower uh, uh, bad uh, behaviors, for example. You have more knowledge about the risks of smoking, and you're less likely uh, to do it. So college-educated people are about a third as likely to smoke as people who did not go to college, and we know that smoking is very deadly. And here are educational differences in the extent to which people use medical care correctly, depending on their education among diabetics. And this, among diabetics. And this slide, which was taken from your readings, shows the variation in various personal behaviors among diabetic patients enrolled in a very famous and large uh, trial, uh, the so-called Diabetic Diabetes Control and Complications Trial, thousands of people were enrolled in the study and randomly assigned to kind of normal diabetes care or super intense medically supervised care, or going to really manage your blood sugars really well to see whether the effort to manage your blood sugars really well, does that actually prevent the complications of diabetes? Does it help you or not? It had been assumed it did, this trial showed that it, would, uh, that it would happen. And between 1983 and 1989, this trial enrolled 1,441 patients, aged 13 to 39 years, who had insulin-dependent diabetes, and they were followed for between 1 and 15 years, uh, and uh, who had had the diabetes between 1 and 15 years, and then they were then randomized to either intensive or conventional therapy, and were followed for about uh, 10 years after that. So they take young people, they enroll them in the trial, and they followed it for a while. So here then, among the people in the study at baseline, the number of times they self-monitored blood glucose per week, it's good to monitor your glucose if you're diabetic, the, uh, the, more, uh, the more education you have, the more often you do that. The missed insulin injection, at least once a month, missing your insulin injection is bad, the less likely you're to do that monotonically with the more education you have. Do not follow your insulin regimen. Do not self-test for blood. Minutes of very hard exercise and currently smoking cigarettes. Every one of these behaviors, the more education you had among this population of diabetics, the uh, less likely you were to be on the bad end uh, of the spectrum. Now, one way to measure how good the control you're achieving of your diabetes, if you're a diabetic, 
is to measure something called the hemoglobin A1C level. Now, uh, our red blood cells, if you're a diabetic, I can test your blood and see how much sugar there is in it right now, but that's like a moment-to-moment -moment measure. What I really would like to do is not an instantaneous measure of your sugar, but some kind of integration across time of what your average sugar levels have been over the last few weeks. And the way they do that is they measure something called your hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of how much sugar is stuck to your red blood cells. It's like sugar-coated donuts. I measure how much sugar coating there, there is on the blood cell donuts that are in your body. And that's a way of measuring the kind of steady state uh, sugar control. And Goldman and Smith, in your readings for today, hypothesized that imposing the intensive regimen for controlling diabetes in this trial should have had a larger impact on the less educated participants because of their poorer self-maintenance in normal circumstances. And this is a very stringent test of their hypothesis. You focus on, you force the uneducated to do the right thing. You address the structure rather than the agency. You see, oh my god, if you force them to do the right thing, then you achieve the uh, objective that you want. And so here, if you look at the data on the slide, take it from your readings, you see an increasing hemoglobin A1C level across lower education in both treatment arms uh, of the study. So for example, this shows, uh, in the conventional therapy group, this shows the hemoglobin A1C level at baseline. And the more education you have, the lower the number. It goes from 8.96, 8.76, 8.44. And at the end of the study, you see whether or not it changed. And here, you don't see much change from the beginning to the end of the study. And now, you look at uh, uh, the uh, intensive treatment group. And you see, OK, here it is at baseline, and here it is at the end. And here's the difference. And now you subtract these two numbers for the treatment effect, which was how powerful was the treatment comparing treatment to control in each of the education groups, and you see that the biggest number here occurs in the people with the least education. So the biggest bang for the buck in this study is occurring among the people with the uh, lowest education uh, in, uh, at the baseline. That is, the impact of enforcing a common treatment regimen can be discerned by subtracting what normally would occur, the control sample, from what took place under the enforced treatment regimen and the results suggest that enforced treatment had a much larger impact on the less educated patients, which is what uh, Goldman and Smith were arguing. OK, which of you, who of you sleep on your backs? Raise your hand if you sleep on your back. I think it's like the most ridiculous posture to sleep in. Who sleeps on, you know, on your belly? Yay, belly sleepers. Uh, who sleeps on your side? Most of you. OK, so people sleep in different positions. Most of you probably have been sleeping this way since you were babies. You probably didn't give much thought to this. Here's a very non-scientific study taken from the internet. The fetal position, the trunk, I don't know who the hell is sleeping in the trunk position. <laughs> I'm asleep now. I really am. Uh, the nostalgic position, no, don't go. The, uh, the soldier position, the free fall position, and the starfish position, which is probably the most ridiculous position. But anyway. This is not a very scientific survey. Another Canadian survey found that 39% of people preferred the soldier position and 28% preferred to sleep on their sides with their legs bent and the field position and so forth. But anyway, people seem to have a natural sleeping position. And we actually don't fully know whether they're natural or not, but people seem to have lifelong sleeping position. We don't know if you're born with this tendency or whether you acquired it in early childhood because of how your parents uh, treat you. Well, what if, what if you didn't? What if you don't force people to do the right thing? What if instead of forcing them, like in the diabetes trial, you give them a, a free, easy, life-saving intervention, like something known as the Back to Sleep campaign described in your readings? So the Back to Sleep campaign was a public health campaign a couple of de a decade or more ago, in which we, it, was it was known that people who sleep on their belly are at higher risk for SIDS, for sudden infant death syndrome, that people are more likely to suffocate than people sleep on their back. So they said, let's do a big campaign to teach parents to flip their babies over. Now, when you're a baby less than one, you, don't, you can't turn her over, right? You're, you're stuck in whatever position your parents put you in. It's actually really nice when you have young babies because you can leave them unattended for a moment and they can't go anywhere. So you put the baby, so you, you put the baby uh, on their belly or on their back, they're stuck uh, in this position, okay? And so we said, let's just teach people the back to sleep campaign, flip the baby over and put them on their backs, it's gonna save their lives, okay? It's free, it's easy, it doesn't require a lot of know-how how to do this, 
No money or technology is required. And so when they did this back to sleep campaign, here they show the SID, sudden infant death cases, per 1,000 uh, births. Here let's look at the whites comparing before and after. And this is by, uh, by education. So if you look before, you see the education gradient that we've already described. So the more education you have, the less likely your baby is to die from SIDS. Everyone with me so far? Usual age grade, usual education gradient in the bad health outcome. More education, people are better off. And if you compare the most educated to the least educated, they're the, most, the less educated people are five times as likely to have their babies die of SIDS as the well-educated people, all right? This is the pre-period amongst whites. Everyone with me still? Now, we have this big campaign, and we come back and we look afterwards at what happens. Are people putting their babies on their backs to sleep? We think they are. If so, we should reduce mortality. And we do reduce mortality. Every one of these little bars is lower than the bars here. Everyone with me still? But the gap between the rich and the poor is bigger than it was before. Once again, widening differentials, even in the face of improvements in the whole population. Everyone understand? So even though we've successfully reduced the mortality with this simple free campaign, we have succeeded in doing that, we have wider differentials. So that's one piece of evidence, interesting thing from this slide. But you also have other interesting things happening in these data. For example, if you look at blacks versus whites, blacks versus whites always had higher SID rates. So these rates are higher in every category than these rates and these rates. And the decline in blacks is lower than the decline in whites. Right, here to here is lower than here to here. Again, widening differentials, even though you've uh, launched this thing. I forgot your name already. Rosario. Rosario, huh? So this is one of the things we're going to discuss intellectually in the class. What's our objective? Is our objective to reduce economic or racial or other disparities in our society? Or is our objective to reduce or improve health in our society? Or both? And what if, this is the hardest one, there's a trade-off between the two. So actually you can improve everyone's health, but in so doing you widen the gap, which is the pattern we've been seeing, right? And so it creates all kinds of moral, practical, uh, and scientific conundrums when you think about this phenomenon. So we've said many examples so far in this class of widening differentials in the face of improvements. This is yet another one. So I could ask you, one thing we could do in this situation to really fix the problem is we'll kill some white babies. Then we would have a really good, uh, the gap would not be you know, a problem anymore, but we clearly wouldn't recommend that course of action. Here we're going to see a hint of another phenomenon, which is the whole Hispanic paradox. Hispanic groups are doing better <coughs> than the white groups right from the beginning and afterwards, OK? So Hispanics tend to, eat, tend to have better health than whites in a number of ways. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Yeah, what's your name? Uh, John. John, yeah. I'm sorry, can you speak up just a bit? Yeah. You can go to the factor of five. I'm sorry, can you speak up just a bit? Yeah. You can go to the factor of five, factor of seven. The difference between 2.5 and 3.5, it goes from 2 to 1.5. So does that mean there's a better improvement among the less educated? In absolute terms, you mean rather than in relative yeah. terms? Yeah, so, uh, so that's also very interesting, but I'd rather not go into that right now, if you don't mind. I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes analyzing it. But it's discussed, I think, in the paper. I can't remember right now, actually, that particular detail. But, it's, but, but the absolute impact could be different in the groups, and you still have a different relative impact. So you're saying, if I understand your question, Nicholas, you're asking, here you go from 2.5 to 1.75, dropping 0.75 points. Here you go from 0.5 to 0.25, dropping fewer points. Why is it bigger in this group than that group? But the relative difference is bigger. Is that your question? Yeah, let's talk about that afterwards. OK. So, um, so higher death rates of blacks and lower rates of Hispanics, despite lower SES compared to whites. The death gradient is present by education in each race. Uh, it improves and so forth. Um, and so, um, so although the risk of SIDS has been reduced for all social class groups, women who are more educated have experienced the greatest decline. And there are two possible, not mutually exclusive, explanations for this phenomenon. First, either the information about infant sleep position is not being disseminated as fully to women in low social class groups. That would be a structural explanation, right? Something about the campaign isn't reaching the people that need it. Or women in low social class groups are receiving appropriate advice but not taking it. That would be an agency explanation, right? We do everything we can to get you to do the right thing, and you're choosing not to do the right thing. 
That's not our fault in some sense. Now, it's important to realize that the relationship between SES and health could actually run in the opposite way. And this is the issue of reverse causation. And more generally, when one observes associations in the world, it doesn't necessarily imply causation. When you see two factors that are associated with each other, it doesn't mean that one is causing the other. So it could be, in fact, that it's not SES that causes health, but health that causes SES. What are some ways that could happen? Give me some ideas. How could, how could health cause SES? Yeah. Disability yeah, if you're sick, you're going to be less likely to earn. If you're born blind, your lifetime earnings are going to be less than if you're born sighted, let's say, on average. Other ideas. Yeah? You have passion to actually work for earlier in life and continue your education. I'm sorry, say that again? You might have to um, provide for your family earlier on and continue your education. You mean if, you, if your health is poor, you mean? Uh, yeah, if you're like, yeah. So your health is poor. You have less options to like continue your education, and that results in lower education for you in the long run. What was your name? Liz. Liz. Liz, yeah. <clears throat> Other ideas? Yes? If you're unhealthy, you're sicker, that's expensive, so you could go to bankruptcy, or... Yeah, you could lose your money because of your lack of health, and so forth and so on. Um, and there are a number of ways that this can be observed, in fact, because when it comes to wealth, it isn't just a correlation across individuals, whereby healthy people are richer, there's an association across time within individuals whereby healthy people get richer. That is, better health is associated with greater wealth and also greater increases in wealth in the future. And this data also comes from your repeats. It shows initial health and initial and subsequent wealth status. So it says, okay, what's your health at time at the first period and what happens over time? Uh, here, you can see that people in excellent health continue to grow in their wealth, where people in poor health actually decline in their wealth as they're spending down their money to take care of their bad health situation. And this is what happened, one of the ways in which uh, uh, health can cause uh, wealth rather than the other way uh, around. And you guys have suggested a number of ways uh, that this can happen. Poor health can develop, result in reduced education and training, spending down of savings, or loss of earnings from work, for example. Um, and so the, those of us that are uncoordinated or blind or diabetic or mentally ill and so on may receive lesser educations or have fewer opportunities both early and later in life. And health can affect wealth in other ways too. Here's what happens in a sample of adults in their 50s when there's a major illness such as cancer or stroke. And this slide shows various changes over an interval of four years in a famous data set called the Health and Retirement Survey uh, that involved 22,000 people uh, over the age of 50. And what it found was, okay, what happened to the wealth changes in, uh, what happened financially to these individuals over a four-year period? They had to spend uh, $28,000, if they had cancer or, or a stroke, they had to spend $28,000 in total medical expenses, they had to spend this much out of pocket, and the net wealth of those individuals with these diseases declined by almost $17,000. So serious illness uh, harms your wealth. And in fact, most of many of you don't know this, but what's the leading cause of bankruptcy in the United States? Illness. Illness. People fall ill. We're just struck, you know, maybe through no fault of our own, and uh, the family is ruined <coughs> as a result of this. So a lot of poor people are poor because they got sick. That's what uh, happened. Now, it turns out it's not the actual expenses uh, that are causing this to happen. It's the decreased ability to work. It's reduced earnings. The health reduce your earnings. It's not what you're spending uh, on health care. That's the problem. And of course, as most of you have probably been anticipating, the relationship between SES and health cuts both ways. And actually, it depends a bit on which SES measure we're using, education, income, uh, so forth, what health measure we're using, and what stage of life and over what time horizon, in a, in a complicated way that I'm going to summarize uh, in just a moment. And it's important, regardless, to also exclude a problem of inference known as confounding. So let's say you go into the world and you look at people and you see that Xbox use or TV viewing uh, causes a heart attack. Now, or Hulu or something, I don't know, YouTube. Uh, and uh, Facebook, well, actually, the case is with Facebook. So, um, or shopping while you're in the lecture. Uh, and you find that, uh, that in class shopping uh, causes a heart attacks. I wish it did. Uh, and, uh, and so, would you conclude?
conclude that the, like, that the TV screen is like emitting these waves, you know, these waves are coming out and they're going through your sternum and they're like affecting your coronary arteries and the coronary arteries are plugging up and you're getting a heart attack. No, you would think that's really not what's happening. It's not that the TV is causing you to have a heart attack. You would say there's something else, some other thing like a sedentary lifestyle that's causing both the TV usage and the heart attack. And the relationship between TV view and heart attack that you thought was causal actually is spurious. There's some third factor that's confounding the relationship uh, between the two. And so in the case of SES and health, not only can there be a two-way causation where SES causes health and health causes SES, but it could be even more complicated still. There could be other factors, for example, personality traits that cause you, like someone mentioned this, like if you're like really obsessive about things, Maybe that makes you rich, but it also makes you healthy, you know, being really attentive to details in your life. Or the opposite, maybe if you're really obsessive, you get really stressed. But the point is not the direction. The point is there could be some other factor that's associated with both of these uh, phenomena. Now, in an ideal situation, we could do somehow, we could somehow do experiments where we give people wealth and see what health results from this. If we cannot do that artificially, however, maybe we could do some kind of natural experiments. Now, remember the doctor strikes we talked about? A couple of lectures ago, a natural experiment of what would happen if we removed healthcare from the system. What can you think of some natural experiments that would naturally and randomly assign wealth to people? Yeah. What's your name? Lucky. Lucky? Yeah, what's lottery. your name? Lottery. Lucky is proposing a lottery as a solution to the problem. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, yes, that's right. A lottery, for example, might be an exact kind of way in which you could use a natural experiment. And scientists have thought of this. Um, and have done a number of studies where they looked at lottery winners compared to non-winners. Here's longitudinal data regarding a random sample of Britons who received medium-sized lottery wins of up to 120,000 pounds, that's about $200,000, and they're then compared to two control groups, one with no wins and the other with small wins. And these individuals then go on to exhibit substantially better psychological health. So on the left is one experiment, B shows mean, uh, mean changes in something called the GHQ, which is a measure of your mental health. And here's what happens amongst people who won a lottery of, uh, of more than 1,000 pounds, so up to $200,000. And here's two control groups, people who won a tiny lottery and people who had no win among individuals who uh, play the lottery. So conditional on the lottery, what happens to your mental health if you win? And it turns out over a time period of a number of years afterwards, your mental health gets better if I randomly assign you to get uh, some money. And in fact, two years after the lottery win, the average measured improvement in mental well-being is 1.4 GHQ points on a 36-point scale. And to provide you a better feel for what that is, becoming widowed and losing your spouse is about a five-point movement. So winning a couple hundred thousand dollars is about as good for you, about a, about a third as good for you, as losing your spouse is bad for you. So that's a big effect on your mental health, giving you a couple hundred thousand dollars has a big impact on your mental health. The other paper on the right also studies the effect of income on health and mortality using lottery prizes. And the findings are that a higher income causally generates good health and that this effect is of similar magnitude as when traditional regression-based observational models uh, are used. And they found that a 10% income increase improves health by about four to five percentage uh, points on the standard deviation scale. So winning about 100,000 uh, Swedish kroner uh, in the lotteries uh, over a 13-year period uh, increases general health by about three percentage points on a standard deviation scale. And again, the, the details are not important. The bottom line is uh, if you look at uh, all of these outcomes, number of years of immobility, being overweight, being dead at different time intervals, basically, uh, regardless of the kind of regression statistical technique you use, whether it's OLS, ordinary least square, sort of Poisson, or ordered probate models, all the details we need to know, the bottom line, these are all negative coefficients, and most of them are significant, meaning that randomly assigning people some money improves their health on lots of measures. So the nature of this, are there any questions about that so far? Yeah, in the back. Uh, is there a grade depending on how much money you win? Well, that's what they tried to hint at here. Uh, and actually, it would be really hard to do the gradient study, but we'll come back to observational data in one or two lectures where we look at the declining marginal return, uh, the, you know, the more and more money. So Bill Gates is not much healthier than a, hundred, and then a centimillionaire, than a centimillionaire is, than a millionaire, and then a millionaire is, than a, 
poor person. You know, it's like this. We'll get to that. Other questions? Yeah, what's your name? Leah. Leah. When you uh, said that uh, wealth decreases in effect of uh, major illness events is because of decreasability of work and not because of the cost of medical Not care. so much because of the cost. Right. Both happen, yeah. Okay. But how can you make that distinction? So they look at, they look at if, I, if, I, if I suddenly like give you a stroke, I can look at how much money you spend, okay. and I can look at your, how much less money you earn, and then so you have $100,000 in the bank today, and I give you a stroke. And then I come back in three years, and I see how much money you have in the bank, and I see, well, how much of your is due to the fact that you spent it. Yeah, it's a, kind of, it's a kind of actuarial assessment. So, um, so the nature of the interrelationship of health and SES, and in particular income, might actually be life stage specific. And it could be the case that early in life, SES can affect your health, and then it affects your health at the early point, and has a long reach affecting you later on, a lingering effect. But later in life, it could be the reverse, as we saw with the HRS data, that health affects SES. So it could be life stage specific, the direction of the causal arrow. And since the factors we considered earlier, like behaviors, nutrition, access to health, and so forth, appear to account for only a portion of the putative effect of SES and health, people have begun to take a closer look at a variety of other intriguing explanations. So there's an enormous group of scientists around the world that are trying to understand the origins of health, and in particular the social origins of health. Uh, and, and some of that explanation can be ascribed by whether you smoke, and whether you manage your diabetes, and whether you sleep on your back, and the things we've been talking about, but it doesn't explain all of it. So people like me are trying to figure out well, what are some other ways that we can understand what are the social determinants of health above and beyond behavioral, the, the conventional kinds of things, spending, behaviors, and so forth that you guys have already put on the table. And here are a couple of ideas. We'll consider a number of them over the course. Of course, here are a couple of ideas. One set of ideas has to do with this notion of social hierarchy. Maybe there's something about social hierarchy that's relevant to people's health. Uh, and also this issue of childhood exposures or marking, these ideas about things that you experience early in life that mark you for the rest of your life. And they may mark you socially or, very interestingly, epigenetically, which we'll also be discussing uh, in the class. Now, let me just introduce a couple of those ideas of today because we'll return to them. The focus on, uh, on the role of hierarchy stresses both the relative position in society and also position in immediate social networks with respect to your social group. So it's not, it's not your absolute standing in terms of your education or wealth that might matter. It's your relative standing might also matter is the thinking. And part of the motivation for thinking this is that the relationship between education and income and health has persisted forever, even despite the substantial rise in education and income for all people in the United States. So think about this. If it were your absolute income that was important, if you had a certain amount of money, then you could be guaranteed to be healthy. But I also tell you that the United States has become vastly richer in the last 100 years, which you all know to be the case. Why aren't we all healthier now? Like all just cured of our illness, none of us suffering from any diseases. Well, maybe part of the explanation is that it's not your absolute value of health that matters, it's your relative standing that matters. And there were rich and poor people 100 years ago, and there are rich and poor people today, and there'll be rich and poor people 1,000 years from now. So maybe what's important is not your absolute wealth, but your relative wealth. This is a very important idea, and we'll return to it a couple of times, a couple of lectures uh, coming up. So the claim here is, is that even if I, just, if I gave all of you each a million dollars, your relative positions and how healthy you were, even though you're all suddenly richer and can buy anything you want, still is going to be differentiated. Those of you at the very top, let's say, those of you at the bottom. The second idea listed here is something known as the Barker hypothesis. And the Barker hypothesis supposes that nutritional or other deprivation in utero may lead to preferential blood flow to critical organs and the deprivation of other body parts setting up problems later in life with metabolism, the coagulation system, the cardiovascular system, and so forth. So the idea is babies that, for whatever reason, their mothers were starving, their mothers were stressed, their mothers experienced certain life events, there's decreased blood flow to the uterus, the baby is getting decreased blood flow, decreased oxygen, and what does an organism do in a situation like that? It, spare, it preserves the brain and spares uh, the trunk. Right? I'm sorry, spares the brain and harms the trunk. So what's happening is, is that the blood flow is preferentially going to the brain of the baby, 
and other parts of the baby are not getting as much blood flow. So for instance, maybe your pancreas doesn't develop embryologically to be quite as healthy. So your mother starving while you were in utero with her sets you up for diabetes later in life because you have a different kind of pancreas now because you were exposed to starvation while you were in utero, for example. And these conditions later in life can contribute to higher risks of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and so forth. And similar work's been done with, uh, with victims of exogenous famines, for example, very famously with the Amsterdam famine in World War II, looking at the outcomes of babies that were conceived during the famine versus the outcomes of babies that were conceived not during the famine. And we're going to learn a little bit about this too later in the class, some ideas about how these social factors literally become embodied. So like, one of the things that you all have probably taken for granted, maybe even before you came to this class, was that poverty kills you. Poverty's bad for you. Well, how? How exactly does poverty kill you? Like, what does it do to your body? How does it get under your skin? And how can we understand physiologically how it is that these social exposures, such as poverty, get, in, get embodied, get instantiated within your body? So we're going to talk about that as well. So now, regarding the Barker hypothesis, uh, these are data from almost 2,800 male Finnish babies that were born in the Helsinki University Central Hospital during 1924 to 1933. And the table shows something called standardized mortality ratios, which is a way of measuring the probability of death, from coronary artery disease according to something called the pondral index. So the pondral index is uh, it's a kind of measure of how big you were uh, when you were born. And so it's kilograms per meter squared, uh, your height in meters squared, so it's sort of a meters cubed, rather. Uh, and, um, and so the bigger you are, uh, the bigger you are, and here's the likelihood of dying of coronary artery disease, it declines. So bigger babies are less likely to have coronary artery disease. So your risk of coronary artery disease depends on your birth weight, basically. Something over which you had no control whatsoever, something which may be related to your genes, but also something that may be related to how much food and, and other opportunities your mother had while she was pregnant with you. And the data suggests that restricted growth in utero is associated with an increased risk of coronary artery disease. So if your mother endured a famine or was malnourished, this would mark you for the rest of your life. Moreover, other work by this research group has shown that men who grow slowly in utero remain biologically different to other men. They are more vulnerable to the effects of low socioeconomic status and low income on coronary heart disease. And conversely, men who were not fit at birth were more resilient to the later effects of poor living standards at subsequent point in their lives. So this is a subtle point, and what I'm saying is, not only does the fact of being small at birth place you at risk for bad outcomes, but also being small at birth accentuates the bad, income, bad impact of bad exposures. You get a double whammy. You're small, it puts you at risk for bad things happening. You're small, you're less able to resist the impact of bad things that happen to you. So both things uh, can happen as a result of being small. But the Barker hypothesis only kicks in if you actually survive your infancy. You could, of course, just die uh, to begin with. And these are the rates of neonatal deaths per, per thousand births according to maternal race and education in the United States in 1998. And uh, what you see here is that these are the rates of babies born, of babies dying uh, amongst whites. And here's what's happening according to education. You're less likely to die at birth, the more educated your mother is. Black babies are more likely to die than white babies, but the same education gradient. Here's Hispanic babies are lower than black babies. Here's the Native Americans, and here's an Asian and Pacific uh, Islanders. So SES matters, and it precedes health in many, many uh, situations. Now, the other thing I mentioned was this idea of social hierarchy. And social hierarchy is also an important variable. Uh, and ideas about it relate to your relative standing versus your absolute standing, suggesting that your position in society itself confers risk. It's not just how rich or poor you are. It's where you are in the social sphere. For example, this shows data, which we'll return to later in the class, from something known as the Whitehall 2 study. So looking at the uh, relative rate of, uh, of uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, in different classes of employment uh, of, um, in, in this population of people who are all British uh, civil servants working in Whitehall. Administrative here doesn't mean administrative assistant or secretary. This is the most senior position. And again, you get this gradient from the most senior to the less, the less, the less. So basically, the people that were higher up in the hierarchy 
are less likely to get uh, coronary artery uh, disease. And this is in a population of Britons, all of whom have access to the National Health Service, all of whom are employed, all of whom are employed in a very safe position. They're all reporting to the Whitehall, to the government, to work um, every day. And the relative rates of death were adjusted here for age, smoking status, systolic blood pressure, cholesterol, and all kinds of other things. And we'll return to this at the end of the class as well. So you can actually sketch out a whole life course model regarding how different aspects of SES affect different aspects of physiology at different stages in a person's life. So here you can imagine socioeconomic position. It affects your intrauterine conditions, which affect the circumstances of your birth, such as low birth weight and low retardation, which is I've alluded to already, can contribute to atherosclerosis or coronary artery disease. Afterwards, you go through from birth to childhood to adulthood to old age. It can affect education and environmental conditions, for example, contributing to your smoking, diet, or exercise behavior. Also contributing to atherosclerosis, which can contribute to cardiovascular disease, which can contribute to reduced function or death. Uh, it can affect your working conditions in adulthood, which could, through job stress, contribute to here. Your income and your assets in old age, which could contribute to inadequate medical care. And each one of these pathways could be different at different stages of life uh, as you go across uh, the life course. And not all disparities are the same, either in magnitude or importance. So some of the socioeconomic disparities that we've been discussing today would seem more unfair than others. So disparities that arise due to race often seem much more unfair than those that arise due to income, because you have absolutely no control over your race, whereas you might potentially have some control over your income. And disparities that arise at birth seem especially unfair. I mean, babies do not deserve, in any sense of the word, the circumstances of their birth. And yet, those circumstances could have very long-reaching effects on what happens. We cannot, in fact, change the natural lottery of genetic endowments and biological circumstances of birth. We'll come back to this idea of the genetic lottery or the natural lottery. But we can compensate for it. And in fact, we can compensate for it, uh, for it in part by intervening in the social lottery. So there are two kinds of things happening to our population. There's the genetic lottery, or the natural lottery, and the social lottery. And we really can't do very much about the natural lottery, but we can do stuff about the social lottery. And we'll come back to this idea. And as Smith points out, it may be much more effective in terms of policy and money to address the problems early uh, rather than late. And in fact, the return on investment may be much higher uh, than the billions we spent on Medicare, as we saw a couple of lectures ago. Actually, intervening early in life may be much more beneficial than intervening later in life. So SES, is there any questions on that? On, the, on what we've discussed so far? So now I want to close today with one of the big ideas of the, class, of, the, of, the, of the course. And it was assigned in a very important reading uh, for today, the Lincoln Phelan article. And the point of the Lincoln Phelan article is to advance an idea. Okay? It's to defend a claim about an idea about the so-called fundamental causes of illness. And Lincoln Phelan argued that socioeconomic status is a fundamental cause of disease. And fundamental causes, of, and it is a fundamental cause for the following reasons. Because the association of SES and health has persisted despite changes of intervening mechanisms, despite wholesale elimination of risks, despite changes in causes of death, and despite increases in life expectancy. Despite all of that stuff, that the cause of death are changing, we're all living longer, we're getting richer, we still see socioeconomic status as being associated with health. And this is one of the reasons we can speak of it as a fundamental cause, socioeconomic status. The relationship between SES and health is fundamental. It's there even despite the fact that all these other things are changing. Second, the argument is that fundamental causes are about access to material and non-material resources. And such access is always differentially distributed. And so it will be differentially accessible to produce utility in individuals. So fundamental causes have to do with who gets what. Given a, given a pie of fixed size, who's going to get how much of it? That has to do with the fundamental causes. And the notion of fundamental causes also relies on the existence of change in the biological and social world. Because of change, 
socioeconomic status can remain a fundamental cause. So what happens is, is in public health and in clinical care, we run around trying to fix problems. We're like, too many babies are dying from SIDS, let's fix it. And you go and you fix that problem. Let's say you successfully fix it. Or too many babies are dying of polio. Let's have a vaccination campaign and stop polio in our society, which was previously affecting, let's say, one group more than another group. And you fix that. Or you see that elderly people are dying of coronary artery disease. And you fix that. And you fix it, and you fix it, and you fix it, and you fix, it, and you fix it. But no matter how much you fix, it's still the case that the poor are worse off than the rich when it comes to health. That's what we mean when we say it's a fundamental cause. Because we deform, we address part of the system over here, and then, oops, something else appears. Some other change in the system is permissible that allows these things to, to persist, the relationship to persist, despite the fact that we're making intervention. And the idea is that in the context of a dynamic system with changes in diseases, in risks, in knowledge, in technologies, in, and in treatments, Fundamental causes can emerge and persist and can have an enduring impact. They are responsible for the differential access to goods necessary to produce utility and so are responsible for differential outcomes. Because in fact, fundamental causes involve access to resources because they involve, because fundamental access uh, involve, uh, because fundamental causes relate to access to resources, they can influence multiple risk factors and multiple outcomes. And consequently, the relationship between a fundamental cause and illness can be preserved through changes either in the mechanisms or outcomes being considered. And this is a very key idea we're going to continue to explore. So any questions about, about this and what we discussed today? Am I moving too fast for you when I talk to you? It's OK? It's clear? OK. Questions? All right, any, yes? It's just regarding the biological world, isn't like in genes and that kind of thing, or what do you mean by that? Genes are, could be things outside, like germs or things outside your body. There's, you know, we're embedded in not only a social environment, but a physical environment and a biological environment. And all of this stuff is changing across time, but no matter what. I mean, you can go, you can go to uh, societies that have a completely different organization than ours and face completely different biological and physical environments, and still there too, the rich fare better than the poor. And you know, why is that? Is it a natural lottery? Is it the social lottery? Is it both? And you know, what can we do about that state of affairs? OK, any administrative stuff? All right, see you guys next time.